Welcome to Deloitte's Debrief's Tax Webcast Series in Asia Pacific. Our webcast today is from our Geography Update Series and is titled Hong Kong SAR Budget 2021-22 Commentary. My name is Sarah Chen and I'm a tax partner based in our Deloitte China Hong Kong office. Because with me today, Alfred Chen, Roy Pan and Alan Tong. Alfred is a tax director and has been working with me for years in monitoring annual budget estimates and tax measures proposed by the government. Roy is an international tax director focusing on financial services, and Ellen is a global employer tax services director. You may access our bios on the left-hand side of the screen. Before I introduce the agenda for today's webcast, I would like to take a moment to highlight some of the features of our webcast console. First, all users are on listen-only mode. If you have any content-related questions, you can submit it anytime in the Q&A box at the bottom right of the scheme screen. We will try to answer your question. Second, all laptop users can maximize or minimize each box during the webcast. You may also explore the icons at the bottom of the screen. If you want to download today's slides and related publications, please go to the download and links box. On the other hand, mobile device users can view the slides and answer the survey on screen. Thirdly, if you require an attendance records for this event, you can download your CPE certificate by clicking the request CPE icon at the bottom of the console. Now, let me give you an overview of the topics we will cover today. So first of all, Alfred will talk through some important statistics for the 2021-22 budget and a brief outlook for the coming few years. Secondly, I will talk about some key measures proposed by the financial secretary during his speech. After that, Ellen will talk through some related initiatives about the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. The last section will be for Roy to cover some tax concessions and related tax measures about fund industries. Lastly, in the end, we will have our Q&A section. Now, let me pass to Alfred, who will share with you some key statistics announced in the government budget. Over to you, Alfred. Thank you, Sarah. Financial Secretary Mr. Paul Chan has made his fifth budget speech. Over the past two years, Hong Kong has experienced a very difficult time with the negative impact from the international political tensions, local social activities, and the epidemic. It is not surprising that the government of HKSAR will generate a physical deficit for the year 2020 and 2021. In fact, financial secretaries estimated that the government will have a physical deficit of 257.6 billion. It is a record high. When compared with the original estimation made by the financial secretary in February 2020 of 140 billion, the government has an additional deficit of around 120 billion. What are the major reasons for the difference? Let's look at some positive factors. With the change in some listing requirements and policies, more and more Chinese conglomerates come back to Hong Kong for second listing. The share market is booming, which stimulates the volume of transactions and so the revenue from stamp duties. There is an increase in revenue from salary tax Someone may wonder why the salary tax increased under economic downturn. The reason is that there was a delay in issuing tax assessment in last year. The collections of tax was deferred from last year to current year. So the salary tax increased. If we take, out, take away this factor, the salary tax should decrease instead. In order to take advantage of the low interest rate and to promote Hong Kong as an international bond market, the government deliberately issued more green bonds in recent years. So the net poses from the issuance of bonds also increased a lot. How about the negative factors? 
Land premium decreased was mainly due to the deferment of disposal timetable of a high value commercial site in the year. And regarding the increase in government expenditure to fight against the epidemic, the government has implemented many measures in stabilizing the economy and easing the burden of people. Measures including cash payout program of 10,000 Hong Kong dollars to each Hong Kong permanent residence with age 18 or above, and the employment supporting scheme. And these two measures already cost the government around 80 billion. We went through the figures in the current year. Let's take a look on the full forecast in medium one. Operating deficit. As indicated by the financial secretary, the government will maintain an expansionary physical policy to strengthen the economy and invest for the future, and they will definitely spend more. Hence, the financial secretary foresees that the government will continue to have a deficit for the next five years. Capital financing. As mentioned above, the government would like to take advantage of the low interest rate and to promote Hong Kong as an international bond market. He intends to issue more green bonds in the upcoming years, around 35 billion per, per year, and it will generate more revenue for the government. If we took away this factor, the deficit will be even larger. That's why the financial secretary has indicated in various occasions that the government may reduce the sweetness in the future. The government also expected that the financial positions of government will return to surplus in 2025. Physical reserve. Many people care about the physical reserve the government has. Up to 2020 and 2021, the amount is 903 billion, which is equal to 13 months of the government expenditure. It will maintain in such level for the next five years. It is difficult to tell what is the optimal level we should have. In general, the higher the better and prefer more the less. When compared it with the figures in 2019 and 2020 or before, it has been dropped from 22 months to 13 months, which means that the government expenditure has increased significantly, in particular under the epidemic. In the next slide, we will show you the forecast of GDP for the upcoming years. If you are interested, you can study it on your own. This is a, this is a graph showing the relationship between public expenditure and the GDP. Even, through there is no, even though there is no statutory requirement to tie the public expenditure to a certain level of GDP, it can be observed that the public expenditure was maintained in the range of 16% to 23% of the GDP for more than 10 years. However, with the pressure of aging populations and heavy investments for the future, the government allocated more resources to finance medical, health care, and educational status. The recurrent expenditure on these items has increased significantly, which outweighs the recurrent revenue, causing the operating deficit in the upcoming year. And the government has committed to implement several measures in cutting costs. Let's look at the revenue side. I would like to draw your attention to four items, office tax, salary tax, land premium, and stamp duty. The revenue for this, from these four items already constitute 66% of the total government revenue. These four items have a common characteristic that they are highly and positively correlated to the economy. That means the economy performs well, the revenue will increase. While the economy goes down, they will drop. The question is, is the government to rely on direct taxes, land premium, and stamp duty? Do the government need to widen the tax base? In response, the financial secretary mentioned that the government will carry out consultation on it and also increase the stamp duties on share transfers from 0.1% to 0.13% to increase the revenue. As a closing remark of these sections, the government will continue to adopt an expansionary physical policy to stimulate and improve the economic conditions 
in the short to medium run. In the long run, the government will maintain a healthy public finance and follow the principles of keeping expenditure within the limits of revenue. So I will pass the time back to Sarah. Thank you, Alfred. Um, let us look at the first polling question of today. So you see the question on the slide. Um, it is about um, the deficit. In view of the deficits in the medium run and narrow tax base, do you think the government of the HKSAR should consider introducing the following measures? A, raising the rates for profits tax and salaries tax. B, introducing sales tax or green tax. C, to reduce Wittner. D, uh, all of the above. E, none of the above. Or, uh, don't know, not applicable. So while we are waiting for the feedback from the audience, so Alfred, let me ask you a very quick question. Uh, you share the statistics, and we noticed that the government is forecasting a medium-term deficit. Is it worrying? Uh, what do you think is the possibility of the government to shorten the deficit period or even or accelerate the economic recovery? Uh, honestly speaking, I'm not that worried. And based on the past experience of the government in dealing with the economic downturn, I'm quite confident that the government can overcome it. Provided that the government consider the following, continue its effort in fighting against the epidemic, review the effectiveness of the counter-cyclical measures implemented and allow flexibility for change if necessary. And also get well prepared for cross-boundary travel so that the cross-border business activities can be resumed to normal as soon as possible. I think all this can help. Mm, thank you. So let us look at the feedback. Oh. Wow, surprisingly, 28% uh, of the feedback is suggesting or recommending the government to think about introducing new tax like sales tax or green tax. And um, also 20, about 21, 22% of the feedback is about to reduce witness. Uh, I believe that you already mentioned about the trend for the government to reduce the sweetener. And uh, there are also some very close feedback, um, all or none of the above. Of, none of the above is 90% is more than all of the above. So very interesting. I believe that there are diverse view in the community and also um, um, about, amongst businesses and individuals. Um, so maybe um, let me talk through it um, about some very uh, important measures announced in the uh, budget speech. So, but bear in mind, just a very uh, short reminder is that um, some of the proposed measures are still, uh, is still uh, pending. So they are subject to reading by the Legislative Council and, um, and other lawmaking process as well. So um, you receive further updates from Deloitte once the law is enacted. So to start with, let me talk about two of the uh, very eye-catching measures proposed in the budget. Uh, first of all, it's about the um, boosting the uh, local economy. So the financial secretary has proposed a measure to encourage uh, boost local consumption through giving out electronic purchase vouchers in installments with a total value of $5,000 to each Hong Kong permanent resident a new arrival of the age of 18 or above. Uh, people can use the vouchers for local consumptions through designated electronic payment platforms. The government is in the process of formulating the implementation procedures, including identifying suitable store value facilities operators, and hopefully it can be rolled out in the summer this year. Under this plan, the government is estimated to spend around 36 billion Hong Kong dollars. Another proposed measure, which Alfred briefly mentioned earlier, is about STEM duty. Uh, some of you may know that under the current regulations, STEM duty for transfer of Hong Kong stock is calculated at 0.1% uh, of the consideration or the fair value of the stock, whichever is higher. Each of the buyer and seller has to pay, so the total tax is 
actually 0.2%. Having considered the impact on the securities market and Hong Kong's international competitiveness, the financial secretary announced a proposed increase in the stamp duty rate for transfer of Hong Kong stock from the current 0.1% to 0.13%. Despite the COVID pandemic, the Hong Kong stock market actually has been doing unexpectedly well over the past months. Trading remains active. In addition, in view of the government policy to encourage listing of biotech and life science companies in Hong Kong, and to enhance second listing in the Hong Kong capital market, the proposed increase in stamp duty rate, no doubt, can help generating additional tax revenue. Making reference to the 2020-21 figures, stamp duty collection from Hong Kong stock transfer is around 33 billion Hong Kong dollars. Proposed increase in the stamp duty rate will give rise to at least 10 billion Hong Kong dollars revenue to the government each year. To alleviate the burden of taxpayer businesses and commercial sectors, Financial Secretary has proposed a number of measures, including 100% reduction of profits tax payable for 2020-21, subject to a ceiling of 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. The government is also going to give out subsidies by way of rate concessions, electricity subsidy, uh, and also business registration fee exemption. These can definitely provide some financial relief to businesses in Hong Kong. However, one thing to note is that these measures are not new. Indeed, the amounts of relief have decreased because of the challenging financial position of the government. For the non-commercial sector, the government is also offering a 100% tax reduction with a cap of $10,000 for each of the individual taxpayer for 2020-21. In addition, rates concession for domestic properties and electricity subsidy will also be given out. On the other hand, in order to provide an extra financing option for the unemployed, Financial Secretary suggested setting up a special 100% loan guarantee for individual scheme. Under this scheme, the maximum loan amount per application is six times of the person average monthly income or 80,000 Hong Kong dollars, whichever is higher. There will be a principal moratorium for the first 12 months. If the principal and interest can be repaid within the subsequent five years, the government will fully reimburse the interest paid to the borrower. The next slide talks about two measures in building a livable city and further promoting green finance in Hong Kong. The number of cars, uh, especially private cars, has been on the rise. And in order to relieve traffic congestion, the financial secretary proposed an increase in the first registration tax for private cars by 15% and the vehicle license fee by 30%. These adjustments have been gazetted for taking effect on the same day the budget speech was delivered. With the goal of achieving carbon neutrality before 2050, the government has been promoting development of green and sustainable finance, encourage institutions to conduct relevant investment, financing and certificate activities. In addition, Hong Kong should leverage its role as an international financial center to mobilize capital towards sustainable projects and enhance Hong Kong's position as a green and sustainable finance hub in the region. In relation to this, the government is planning to issue green bonds regularly, expand the scale by doubling the borrowing ceiling and involving more types of currencies. It will also consider issuing retail green bonds for the participation of the general public. With these measures, we hope that top-notch institutions and talents will be attracted to Hong Kong to provide the relevant financing and certification services. On the next slide, I have outlined two of the major focuses in relation to the Guangdong Hong Kong Macau Greater Bay Area Initiative. 
These include a joint project between mainland China and Hong Kong uh, in developing an uh, innovation and technology park and measures to encourage university graduates from Hong Kong to work and receive training in the mainland China cities. In the next section, Ellen will give you more details about the GBA-related measures. About financial services, in addition to the tax concessions already implemented, the Financial Secretary has mentioned two very important proposals about uh, asset management and family office businesses. We believe these suggestions will further strengthen Hong Kong's position and enhance its competitiveness in the asset and wealth management sectors. In the later part of this webcast, Roy will share more information with you. Now, um, the next section is for Ellen to talk about the GBA initiatives. To start, um, maybe let me turn to the second polling question of the day. Does your organization currently have any business presence in Hong Kong, Macau, or any mainland cities within the GBA area? The answers to be to choose is very simple. Yes, no, or currently no, but we expect one will be set up in the near future, or D, currently no in, in our business plan, but maybe in the future, or Y, e, this is not in our business plan, and lastly, don't know or not applicable. Now, Ellen, while we are waiting, uh, I have a quick question and also um, to also hear from you. Uh, what is your observation about companies considering GBA in their business plans? Oh, thank you, Sarah. Yes, um, to many companies that we work with, the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, with the Bay Area, the GBA is really in, unique in terms of bringing together with 11 cities and each has its own niche. So now with over 70 million population in the GBA, companies have found that they're able to find talent with different educational background, experience and expertise in the area and also be able to attract talents around the world to come to work in the GBA. So whether or not the companies currently may already have business presence in the GBA, they do consider how to leverage on these first cast standard infrastructures, talent and the resources available in order to develop or expand their business in the area. And also by looking at the GBA Business Confidence Index released by the Hong Kong Trade Development Councils, it also suggests continuous improvements in the business confidence and business activities in the GBA. The index actually rose from 37 in the second quarter of 2020 to 50.2 in the fourth quarter, despite of the global pandemic. And it is expected that this index will continue climbing in this year. Oh, then it sounds very promising. And I do think that both uh, the, the governments of the three uh, mainland China and the two administrative regions will be, will be very excited and to have more uh, throw off uh, collaboration to promote the GBA initiatives. Now look at the results that we have. Ooh, it's very nice. So 58% of the feedback say that they have considered or they are considering GBA in the business, pre uh, business plan and also have already have business presence in, in this area. And uh, just um, not a majority, like 70% saying that they do not. So uh, hopefully that um, the 80%, 17.9% of the audience uh, after Ellen's presentation will uh, have this put it back on the agenda to think about uh, any opportunities for them in the GBA. So let me pass it to you, Ellen, to talk about the GBA in initiatives and how um, that can create a mutual benefits uh, between Hong Kong and other cities in the area, please. Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
In this year in the budget speech, the financial secretary also talked about how to enhance the collaboration between Hong Kong and the mainland GBA cities by ways of fostering the talent mobility across the region and as well as strengthening the role of Hong Kong in the developments of the GBA. So to support all this, various schemes have been introduced for enterprises and individuals and which align with the Hong Kong government's policy. So Mainly the GBA Youth Employment Scheme and also the China Individual Income Tax Subsidy in the GBA. First, let's look at the highlights of the GBA Youth Employment Scheme. The GBA Youth Employment Scheme, as you may recall, is one of the measures announced by the Chief Executive in her 2020 policy address. It aims to encourage and support young people to work and pursue their career in the mainland GBA cities. Helps the young people understand the latest developments of both Hong Kong and those cities, and also leverage the opportunities for their career advancement in the area. This program is open for Hong Kong residents holding bachelor's degrees or above, awarded by the local or overseas universities, tertiary institutions in between 2019 and 2020 to 2021. And then for enterprise, which are interested in joining the program, they should have operations in both Hong Kong and one of the mainland GBA city, and also have, hold a valid business registration to operate in Hong Kong and China. The scheme will have 2000 openings, and then we'll have around 700 of which in the innovation and technology positions. And the participating enterprise shall engage the eligible graduates under the Hong Kong law. And then each participating graduate will receive a salary of lot less than 18,000 Hong Kong dollars per month. And then in which the company can apply for a monthly allowance of 10,000 Hong Kong dollars for each graduate engaged for up to 18 months or until the first quarter of 2023, whichever comes earlier. And the launch of the GBA Youth Employment Scheme provides mutual benefit to both young people from Hong Kong and also their employers. With the scheme just launched in January this year, we have noticed that there are already over 30 enterprises joined the program. And the schemes provides opportunities for Hong Kong young people to work and live in China. And then they are also able to gain the experience in the industries that may have limited presence in Hong Kong at the moment. And then also as mentioned, the eligible graduates will receive a monthly salary of not less than 18,000 Hong Kong dollars. So the pay is also attractive, especially during this challenging moment. And then for the past 12 or so months, because of the global pandemic, many enterprises have cut down the graduates' hiring. And so no doubt the government subsidized monthly allowance provides the incentives to the companies to hire fresh graduates from Hong Kong. And while the young people have found that the scheme comes from huge development potential and also greater room for their future career advancement. And then now let's look at the China individual income tax subsidy policy in the GBA. And apart from the young people, there are also many, many talents around the world with experience. Um, they're actually interested in pursuing their career in the GBA mainland cities. However, tax is always one of the factors that may make some people become hesitant when deciding to work in China. Because under the current China Individual Income Tax IIT legislation, the tax rates on the employment income are on a marginal basis ranging from 3% to 45%. And then by comparing with the equivalent tax rates in Hong Kong or Macau, the people will find that their after-tax income has been significantly reduced by working in China. So to encourage talent from Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and overseas to live and work in the GBA. The China Ministry of Finance and also the State Taxation Administration have introduced the GBA IIT subsidy program. 
that basically protects the China IIT burden of the qualified individuals working in the GBA as if they had worked in Hong Kong. The GBA IIT subsidy program is available in all light mainland cities within the area, available to those individuals from Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, or overseas. And once the application is approved, then any China IIT being paid for the year in excess of the first 15% will be refunded. And the refund is not subject to tax in China. And this subsidy is available in between 2019 to 2023. And then on the next slide, we can see that apart from the fulfilling the immigration requirements, the individuals also need to satisfy the requirements under either the high-end talent or urgently need talent working in the application GBA cities. And also they have to be there for at least like 90 days during a calendar year. And people also have to file and pay China IIT in the city that they apply for the subsidy. And the subsidy is available to comprehensive income. And that generally refers to the employment income received by people who are employed it, and also applies to business income generated by self-employed individuals and also available for those individuals who receive subsidy income from the talent projects of the government. And then on this, you can see on the right hand side, here's a table that shows the potential tax savings that the qualified individuals can get under the GBA IIT subsidy program. So definitely very attractive. And the first GBA IIT subsidy application for the calendar year 2019 was already closed in summer last year. And many applicants have found the guidelines provided by each city were clear. And also in general, the application process was smooth. And then here I want to share with you the results of the GBA IIT's subsidy survey recently conducted by Deloitte China. Earlier, we had survey enterprises in different industries that already have business presence in one of the GBA city for their view and comments on the IIT subsidy program. And what we have found is 45% of the enterprise participating in the survey said their employee applied for the 2019 GBA IIT subsidy, and the approval rate was about 80%. And then for those companies said that employees did not apply for the subsidy, they were for different reasons. And that could include because their employees did not qualify for the application, but actually more than 25% of them said that they were not aware of such program. And then the survey has also shown that a very high percentage of the enterprise indicate that IIT subsidy is a critical factor in their staff deployment strategy in the GBA. And after going through the first year of their application, they are basically their fee concerns um, company have come up with. One is including whether the sustainability and continuity of the program, considering that the policy is only set to 2023 for now, and the eligibility of their employees to apply for the subsidy and also the application approval way. But with all this said, we actually have found that over 80% of the companies being surveyed said they will proactively assist their eligible employees with the GBA IIT subsidy application in the coming years. So with all this and also to, in to increase the chance of getting the application approved, then we also have found that many companies would consider engaging professional services to perform the peer assessment for their employees to determine their eligibility for applying the subsidy and also to provide support in the application process. So the GBA IT subsidy helps ease people's concern over the tax costs in China and it also makes enterprise revisit their talent strategy and resources allocation. So to make it to align with the GBA policy and that can, will also turn into to make the business can operate more effective and efficient. And now let me pass the time to Sarah. 
Thank you, Alan. So before bringing in the next topic, financial services, uh, let me put up the third polling question. So do you consider the current tax policies, concessions related to financial services, including funds in Hong Kong attractive, especially for foreign companies when considering setting up or relocating businesses to Hong Kong? Very attractive, somehow attractive, not attractive, indifferent, or I don't know what policies they have or not applicable. So Roy, I know you are going to talk about financial services, tax incentives, especially for funds, but um, back to the SAR budget. So we know that um, this is a very important sector in Hong Kong. Uh, is there anything specific you want to highlight to the audience in this year budget uh, concerning measures to boost Hong Kong's financial services sector? Uh, yes, Sarah. Um, as in pirate years, the financial secretary has emphasized in his budget that um, the financial services sector is a key sector for Hong Kong. Uh, broadly speaking, it comprises um, banking and capital market, insurance and asset management. For the capital market, following the successful launch of the Stock Connect and Bond Connect programs, there will soon be a wealth management connect program between Hong Kong and GBP to cover eligible wealth products. In the current budget, the government has proposed a certain incentive to attract more real estate investment trusts, REIT, to go listing in Hong Kong, and more offshore public funds to re domicile to Hong Kong as the, uh, in the form of open-ended companies, OFC. By reimbursing majority of the service fees incurred during the listing or during the re process. Mm. The budget also announced that tax concession will be given to general insurance businesses. Most importantly, the government has been focusing a lot on asset management and family office sector in recent years. There are new tax and regulatory regime introduced by the government in the last couple of years with a view to attracting more funds and fund managers to set up and operate in Hong Kong. I will cover it in a bit more detail in, in, in the coming part. Mm. Thank you, uh, uh, Roy. And and when we look at the feedback, uh, it's some kind of echo what um, Roy you have mentioned because um, majority of the audience think that the current incentives or con uh, concessions are somehow attractive. So I believe that there are still room uh, to improve, and I know, understand that the government is trying to do that. Uh, but also interestingly, I uh, twenty five percent of the feedback. Uh, say that they don't know what policies Hong Kong has. So I think it's better to pass the time to you, Roy, to give uh, the audience a bit more information about uh, what is the current situation and what is the, the trend in the next year, next few years. Yeah, over to you. Sure, sure. Thank you, Sarah. So um, to strengthen Hong Kong's competitiveness as an asset management hub, the government has first introduced the Unified Fund Exemption Regime back on the 1st of April 2019, which provides tax exemption for funds managed in Hong Kong, regardless of the place of incorporation and central management of the fund. Starting from the 31st of August 2020, the government has launched the Limited Partnership Fund regime, we call it LPF regime in Hong Kong, which aims at attracting more PE VC funds to be established in the form of LPF in Hong Kong. As of today, there are already over 100 LPFs set up in less than seven months since the launch of the LPF program. Hong Kong tax treatment on carry interest has long been a debatable area as there were cases where the Hong Kong Inland Revenue Department recategorized carry interest as service fee or employment income and seek to impose profits tax or salaries tax thereon. Thus, Fund managers generally had a concern that if they re domicile their funds and fund management activities to Hong Kong, there is a higher risk of carry interest to be taxed in Hong Kong. In response to the industry feedback, the government has introduced tax exemption on carry interest um, right, basically right before the, um, uh, the current year's budget speech. The draft bill regarding carry interest tax exemption 
has been introduced to the Legislative Council for readings, subject to legislative procedure, the draft bill is expected to apply to carry interest accrued or distributed on or after the 1st of April 2020. So what is the new carry interest tax exemption about? As you can see from the center, provided certain conditions are satisfied, carry interest could be taxed at 0% profit tax rate or fully excluded from employment income for the charge of salaries tax. So basically, uh, it's tax exempt. Surrounding this core key mandate, four new concepts are introduced. These are the conditions that have to be fulfilled to qualify for such tax exemption. Regime. Secondly, the carry has to be distributed by a qualifying carry interest payer. Meanwhile, the carry interest must arise. Also, only qualifying carry interest recipients are eligible for the tax concession. There are other administrative requirements, including certification by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, verification by external auditor, and submission of certain information to the Hong Kong tax authorities in the year where there are carry interest distribution. We will go through more detail one by one. First of all, the draft bill proposed to define the term eligible carry interest as a sum received by or accrued to a person by way of profit-related return subject to a hurdle weight. Profit-related return shall have three conditions. First, if there are profits. Second, the amount paid will vary by reference to the profit. And lastly, the return to external investor are also determined by reference to the same profit. To qualify as eligible carry interest, one key element is that the, the amount is subject to a significant risk where it is possible that a certain portion of it will not be received. This significant risk condition is really to avoid people seeking to disguise management fee as carry interest. Another point to note is that the draft bill does not prescribe any specific or minimum hurdle rate that should apply before an amount can be regarded as eligible carry interest. The second condition is that the carry has to be distributed by a qualifying carry interest payer. According to the bill, the tax concession only applies to eligible carry interest distributed by a fund, which fall within the meaning of a fund under the unified fund exemption regime, which often uh, we call it UFE. Under the UFE, the definition of fund broadly is aligned with that of collective investment scheme in the Securities and Future Ordinance in Hong Kong. According to the practice note issued by the Hong Kong Tax Authorities, arrangement with the characteristic of pooled investment should be within the meaning of a fund. Generally, it refers to arrangement under which the property is managed as a whole, where the investors do not have day-to-day -day control. Another condition is that the eligible carry interest should arise from qualifying transaction in private equity, PE only. We have illustrated on this in this slide the four types of transaction described in the draft bill. So let's start from the left-hand side. The first type of qualifying transaction is that the fund will directly dis dispose of qualifying investment in PE. Now you may ask, what is qualifying investment in PE? This should follow the exemption criteria for PE investment under the unified fund exemption. And I will briefly talk about it in the next slide. The second type of qualifying transaction is that the fund disposing of is qualifying special purposes entity, SPE, which holds an administered qualifying investment in PE. Another question may pop up. What is a qualifying SPE? Again, it's a term defined in the unified fund exemption regime. The third and fourth type of qualifying transactions are the fund's qualifying SPE disposing of the qualifying investment in PE and the fund's qualifying SPE disposing of a qualifying interpost SPE that holds and administers the qualifying investment in PE. As mentioned earlier, in order to be eligible for carry interest exemption, the fund needs to make qualifying transaction in private company which is a term uh, used under the Unified Fund Exemption. 
So what are the specific conditions for a transaction to be treated as qualifying transaction in PD? We have set out in this slide a decision tree for your easy reference. Now the conditions are somewhat complicated, and I won't go over them one by one in the interest of time. But just at a very high level summary, if your fund does not invest in Hong Kong real estate and does not have a controlling stake in a portfolio company, an investment in that portfolio company should be a qualifying transaction under the UFE. On the other hand, if you will have controlling stake in a portfolio company, you will need to satisfy a two-year holding period test in order for that investment to be regarded as a qualifying transaction. For other cases, please feel free to look at the decision tree here. The draft bill proposes that tax exemption will only be eligible to qualifying carry interest recipients, which are defined to include the following three types of person. First, a SFC, uh, Securities and Futures um, Commission, licensed per, uh, corporation or authorized FI, financial institution, which provide investment management services in Hong Kong to a fund certified by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. That being said, we understand that some PEVC funds do not have a regulated entity in Hong Kong. The rule also cater for such a situation where by qualifying carry interest recipient also includes a long SFC licensed person who provide investment management services to a fund which satisfies the definition of qualified investment fund. Here, the term qualified investment fund is defined again under the Unified Fund Exemption Regime, UFE, which include conditions such as having five or more external investors contributing at least 90% of the capital of the fund uh, at the time of final closing. Lastly, qualifying carry interest recipient also include an individual who derives accessible income from their employment with the two types of eligible entity that I've just mentioned, as well as their associated entity in Hong Kong. It's important to note that in view of the policy objective for attracting more funds and fund managers to come to Hong Kong, the qualifying carry interest recipient have to provide investment management services in Hong Kong. Investment management services is defined to include the following activities. Uh, first, um, seeking from, from the, uh, for the purposes of uh, the certified fund from external investor, that means uh, fundraising activities. Secondly, uh, doing research and advice on uh, potential investment for the purposes of a certified fund. Acquiring, managing, or disposing of property and investment for the purposes of certified fund. And lastly, acting for the purposes of the certified fund with a view to assisting an entity in which the fund has made an investment to raise funds. Besides, similar to other preferential tax regime in Hong Kong, uh, such as the ship leasing regime or the corporate treasury center regime, there is a substantial activity requirement uh, under the new carry interest tax exemption regime. It is proposed that, that in order to meet the substantial activity requirement under the carry regime, the eligible carry interest recipients need to have, first of all, an average of two or more full-time employees that perform the investment management services in Hong Kong. And secondly, an annual operating expenses of Hong Kong dollar two million or more that are incurred in Hong Kong for the provisions of investment management services. One should also note that the above substantial activity requirement would need to be met for each year of, assess year of assessment during the relevant period, which referred to the period from the date when the qualifying carry interest recipient starts to perform investment management services in Hong Kong to the date when the eligible carry interest is received or accrued to the carry recipient. Now you may ask, what does a fund or fund manager need to do in order to enjoy the tax exemption on carry interest? First, a fund will have to go through an upfront certification process, which is administered by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. To apply for certification, a fund should submit an application to the Hong Kong MA together with relevant documentations and information as requested by the Hong Kong MA. The Hong Kong MA will then assess whether the fund makes PG investments and whether substantial activity requirements are likely to be met. A letter of certification will be issued by the Hong Kong MA if they are satisfied that the relevant criteria are likely to be met. Secondly, 
for a particular year where there is a distribution of eligible carry, an external investor should be engaged to verify that the relevant uh, conditions under the carry interest regime are met. The auditor's report should be kept by the fund and ready for the inspection if needed. In addition, information in relation to distribution of eligible carry interest should also be reported to the commissioner of the inland revenue uh, in the year where distributions are made. To wrap up, it's encouraging to see that the Hong Kong government has been very proactive in recent years to enhance the legal and tax regime of fingers in order to attract more PE funds and fund managers to come to Hong Kong. This slide summarizes the tax implication for a Hong Kong domicile fund structure, assuming the fund is set up in the form of Limited Partnership Fund, LPF, in Hong Kong, with a GP general partner in Hong Kong and a Hong Kong fund manager. The LPF, although it's a Hong Kong registered limited partnership, which is a separate person from Hong Kong tax perspective, should be exempt from Hong Kong profits tax if the qualifying conditions under the Unified Fund Exemption Regime, the UFE, are fulfilled. Therefore, there's no Hong Kong tax at the fund's level if the fund can rely on the UFE. Under the new carry interest tax exemption regime, eligible carry interest accrued to or received by the Hong Kong GP or the Hong Kong fund manager or their employees should also be exempt from the Hong Kong profits tax and salaries tax. Management fee received by the Hong Kong fund manager would be subject to Hong Kong profits tax at 16.5 to the extent attributable to services rendered in Hong Kong. Therefore, potentially part of the management fee can be treated as offshore income and not subject to Hong Kong tax if such part of management fee is attributable to activities such as, such as fundraising or due diligence activities that are carried out outside Hong Kong. Last but not least, another important benefit or potential benefit for using a Hong Kong domicile fund structure is that the LPF or its underlying SPE will very likely be able to obtain the Hong Kong tax resident certificate, the Hong Kong COR, and hence, uh, potentially, they could enjoy the treaty benefits such as capital gain tax exemption under the double tax agreement or arrangement that Hong Kong has entered into with other jurisdictions. So that comes to the end of my sharing. And uh, um, uh, let's um, pass the time back to Sarah. Thank you, Roy. Uh, last year, no doubt, is a challenging year. The SAR government has been trying very hard to come up with some effective and long-term measures, hopefully to accelerate the economic recovery after the pandemic. Financial service sector and capital market are still the key drivers of uh, Hong Kong economy growth and the government revenue. We are expecting that plans will be rolled out very soon to implement the measures. Hong Kong should leverage the GBA platform and explore business opportunities for businesses and young people. Uh, people should also expect that less generic sweetness will be given out, especially during these challenging times, but instead more focused financial assistance and subsidy plans will be introduced to help the uh, needed groups. Lastly, the financial secretary briefly mentioned about uh, BAPS 2.0 in his budget speech. While Hong Kong will continue to maintain its simple and low tax system, we cannot deny the potential impact. The government will closely monitor the situation and be reactive to the initiatives the OECD will announce in the coming year. So thank you, Alfred, Roy, and Ellen. Uh, and this brings us to the end of our today's discussion. Uh, we now still have some time to respond to questions from the audience. So let me take a look at, at what we have. Um, okay, uh, the first question is uh, maybe Alfred can help to answer that. It's about stamp duty, Alfred. Um, the question is about the increase, of course, in the stamp duty rate. Uh, is, do you think that it will lower the competitiveness of the Hong Kong stock market? Especially, uh, we, we know that um, on the date of the budget speech, 
the uh, the stock market in Hong Kong uh, did have some uh, turbulence or, or some significant movements. And every time the financial secretary talk about this stamp duty raise, uh, there are some reaction in the, in the stock market. So what do you think? Uh, would it uh, lower the competitiveness of Hong Kong? I think it was just a coincidence uh, because I found mm -hmm. that uh, at that day, many Asian markets also have a downward adjustment. Uh, I think and uh, transaction costs are only one of the factors affecting the investors' decisions, while the continuing improvement in the share market conditions will set off or even outweigh the negative effect. Uh, in fact, the financial secretary has a patch. Uh, the government will continue to spend more efforts in introducing measures to facilitate the development of the securities market and so as to take our financial service sectors to the next level. Uh, measures including attracting more Chinese conglomerates to come back to Hong Kong for second listing and allowing more biotech companies to be traded under the uh, Stock Connect program. So in fact, with the change in various policies, uh, the conditions of the share markets has become more attractive in the fall to investors. So the volume of transactions will keep on having a, a good trend, a rising trend. Mm, yeah, thank you, Alfred. And yeah, I hope that this will, because I, I know that the stamp duty raise will likely be uh, become effective in August this year, because this is the for the the uh, the plan of the government as well to put it uh, for reading by the legislative council. So we'll see uh, what will happen in August. Um, I've got another question for uh, Ellen. It's about the GBA IIT subsidy. So you talk quite a lot about um, um, applying for the GBIIT subsidy, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the question is about um, employee working in Shenzhen. So um, the company has staff employee working in Shenzhen. Uh, and if they are qualified to apply for the GBIIT subsidy, so what, what kind of formalities? I mean, the, um, is the company still need to perform the monthly IIT withholding procedures or, uh, as normal uh, and then later on apply for the GBA IIT subsidy or, or any other way to do it? Sure. Um, thank you, Sarah. Actually, this is a very good question. Um, and this is uh, one of the points that we keep reminding both the company and those individuals that they plan to apply for the GBA IIT subsidy. The GBA IIT subsidy application will be done once a year. And normally, we'll be doing the summertime. So that actually will happen after the individual has filed their annual individual income tax return for the preceding year. So mm -hmm. what that means is for the monthly withholding for the year, everything will be as normal. The individual will um, have the monthly IIT withholdings in accordance to their salary and then under the current IIT legislation. And then after the tax being paid and then in the following summer, if the individuals qualify, then they can apply for the subsidy. And any tax being paid in excess of the first 15% will be refunded by the local government that they apply for the subsidy. So what we normally will remind the company and the individuals is, especially in the situation, if the individuals are responsible for paying their own China individual income tax, then understand the procedures and also the timing that they, that they may receive the refund so that they can can manage their cash flow properly for the year. Mm, thank you, Alan. Mm, about the IT subsidy, I, I've got um, also uh, one related question is about because um, the IT is a subsidy, right? This is not something like a tax reduction or tax mm -hmm. exemption from the IT perspective. So in mm -hmm. case um, the employee is also paying salaries tax in Hong Kong, the IIT subsidy should not uh, have any impact with respect to the tax credit that particular employee is going to claim in Hong Kong. Is that right? Correct, Sarah. Mm, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I've got another question. Uh, we still have two minutes. Perhaps um, 
one question for Roy. <laughs> Uh, Roy, this is about family office. Um, yeah, the family office is uh, is evolving, and also uh, is a very hot topic nowadays within the region, not just Hong Kong. Um, mm. The government has indeed um, mentioned about tax policies for family office. Do you have yeah. any any insight or any uh, any clue about what what the government is going to mm. to to do? Well, yeah. Um... Thanks, Sarah. Uh, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, and unfortunately, in the budget itself, um, um, basically the financial secretary only says that they will review the relevant tax policies um, in relation to family office business without uh, much detail. Uh, what I understand is um, the government uh, would very likely do some consultation, uh, maybe in coming month or in the second half of this year, uh, to 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 see uh, you know what sort of um, amendment to the current policy would need to be made. I think the the current issue is um, for for a family office. Basically, they are very similar to uh, a, a fund, right? They they use uh, investment vehicle. Uh, maybe to, to 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 pull money together, uh, maybe from one family or maybe sometimes from multi families. Uh, but the but the issue is under the current um, structure may may not um, uh, you know exactly to the, the the context or fit into the definition of, of the exemption regime. So um, uh, I think on on this part, uh, uh, further uh, consultation or studies will, will be needed uh, for, from the government. And especially, I, I think one um, important part is um, uh, when, when during the consultation, uh, how to define a family office is very critical, right? Um, so, so I guess um, uh, we will wait to see more um, information or uh, uh, coming out from the government, especially during the consultation stage um, uh, in, in the coming months. Mm, thank you, Roy. I believe that we will have to do do a very um, uh, hard, working very hard to um, to submit our proposals and our views, suggestions to the government as well, so that they hopefully they, they they can think about and also take into account our suggestions when formulating the the regulation. Thank you. Uh, we are still having questions coming in uh, from the audience, but unfortunately, it is, it is time to close the session. Uh, again, uh, uh, Alfred, Roy, Ellen, thank you. Uh, and special thanks to all of you who were with us in the last hour. We encourage you to fill out the um, short survey that will pop up on your screen momentarily and tell us what you think about today's program. If you join us late, no problem. Please note that this presentation will be archived uh, if you feel that others would benefit, uh, please share this webcast via the share this icon or have them visit our debriefs we submitted during the webcast in a couple of weeks. If you think of any other questions or comments later, feel free to reach out to either me or one of our speakers. We'll be more than happy to talk to you. Uh, please don't forget to tune in to our next scheduled webcast from the Corporate Income Tax Series on 23rd of March. The title is European Union DAC 6, Keeping Up with the Changes. At last, from all of us at Deloitte, thank you for your participation in our webcast, Deloitte's Asia-Pacific Tax Webcast. Goodbye.